In this video tutorial, I am going to discuss about the tertiary structure of protein. Now, this tertiary structure, it refers to the complete three-dimensional structure of wall polypeptide chain. Okay? So, it refers to the complete three-dimensional structure of wall polypeptide chain. Now, let us try to understand it with this thread. Suppose this thread is representing a sequence of amino acid. Okay? Now, in case of primary structure, if we describe simple sequence of amino acid, that is the primary structure. Now, in case of secondary structure, we try to show the close relationship of the nearby amino acids. So, see, this is the secondary structure, right? This is the beta pleated sheet this spring like structure is the alpha helix again this spring like structure is the alpha helix this band may be beta band this may be some non repetitive structure so in case of secondary structure what we do we try to establish a relationship between nearby amino acid see in case of alpha helix all nearby amino acids its relationship is in the helical format in such term we describe that relationship okay so that is the secondary structure in case of tertiary structure what happens? There is a folding of this secondary structure further and then it becomes this complete three-dimensional structure of wall polypeptide chain. So, this three-dimensional structure, it is known as tertiary structure of protein. Now, one important and interesting fact is that by this three-dimensional folding, two amino acids which can be a very far from each other in the primary sequence, they can be brought to near to each other. Let us say for example, suppose this is one amino acid and this is second amino acid, right? Both amino acids are very far from each other in the primary sequence. But in this tertiary structure, in this three dimensional arrangement, because of the folding, this both amino acids are near to each other, right? So, we can say that tertiary structure, it defines the relationship of amino acids which are very far from each other in the linear sequence. So, it defines the relationship of amino acid, relationship of amino acids, amino acids and which amino acids? Those amino acids which are very far from each other in primary sequence. Now, at this point, this fact must be, uh, must be separated from the secondary structure. In case of secondary structure also, secondary structure also, it defines the relationship of amino acid. But which amino acid? Only those amino acid which are near to each other, near to each other in terms of alpha helix and beta pleated sheet, right? So, this must be differentiated. Now, let us look at again this three dimensional structure. This three dimensional structure, it must be stabilized by certain forces, right? There must be certain stabilizing forces. What are these stabilizing forces? So, stabilizing forces of this three dimensional structure. So, it can be of two type. One is covalent and second one is non-covalent. So, covalent and non-covalent. In case of covalent, we have disulfide bonds. So, disulfide bonds and in case of non-covalent, we have three different types of forces. So, one is hydrogen bond, second one is hydrophobic interaction, hydrophobic interaction and third one is the ionic bond. This ionic bond, it is also known as electrostatic bond. electrostatic bond or electrostatic interaction. So, let us first discuss about this disulfide bond. So, disulfide bond. This disulfide bond, it occurs between two SH group. It occurs between two SH group. Remember, this SH group, it is known as sulfhydryl group, sulfhydryl group. Now, where does this SH group occurs? We know that SH group occur in the cysteine amino acid. 
So, in the cysteine amino acid, there is side chain which contain this sulfhydryl group. So, when this one cysteine residues comes near to another cysteine residue, this is another cysteine residue which is also SH bond. So, when this both cysteine comes near to each other, what happens? This hydrogen is removed and this sulfur, it directly binds with this. So, this bond, it is known as disulfide bond, right? Now, remember both cysteine molecule in the primary sequence, they may be very far from each other, but because of the three dimensional arrangement of this tertiary structure, this uh, both the cysteine molecules are able to come near to each other and can make make up this disulfide bond. Now, this bond formation is not spontaneous. One enzyme will help in the formation of this bond. The name of this enzyme is protein disulfide isomerase. It is protein disulfide isomerase. Now, this enzyme is very interesting one. It can make disulfide bond as well as it can break also. Okay? It has very important role during the folding of the protein. Now, what is the purpose of disulfide bond in case of tertiary structure? The main purpose is that it prevents denaturation in extracellular environment. The purpose of this disulfide bond is it prevents denaturation, denaturation of protein in extracellular fluid. Remember, suppose this is a cell and all the proteins are synthesized inside this cell. Okay? So, suppose this protein is synthesized inside the cell. Now, intracellular environment is very different from this extracellular environment. Most of the protein functions intracellularly, but some proteins are there which requires to transport it to this extracellular environment because these proteins are functional in extracellular environment. One example is immunoglobulin or antibodies. Antibodies are formed by plasma cells and then later on secreted. Now, this extracellular environment, it is different from this intracellular environment. So, what happens? There are chances that this protein, it may get denatured, but this is prevented by this disulfide bond. Okay? So, that is the main purpose of this disulfide bond. Then let us discuss about the second type of bond that is the hydrogen bond. So, second we will discuss about the hydrogen bond. For the formation of this hydrogen bond, two participants are required. One is hydrogen bond donor and second participant is the hydrogen bond acceptor. Now, in case of protein, which molecule or which group can act as a hydrogen group donor? So, first group is this NH group, second group is the NH2 group and the third group is the OH group. All these three group can act as a hydrogen bond donor. Now, as a hydrogen bond acceptor, we have only two group, one is C double bond O group and second one is this carboxyl group, C double O minus group, this is carboxyl group. Now, we have to understand the peptide bond. See, the peptide bond is like this. So, in this peptide bond, you can see that there is this NH group which is over here. So, NH group can come from where? So, NH group can be a part of peptide bond. It can be a part of peptide bond which can act as a hydrogen donor. Are there any possibility of NH group? Yes, there is one more possibility. In case of histidine, this is one amino acid. This histidine, its side chain contain imidazole ring. Imidazole ring. And the in this imidazole ring, there is NH group. So, both of these can act as a hydrogen bond donor, right? NH2 group, this comes from where? NH2 group is found in the side chain of lysine and arginine, okay? From where does this OH group comes? OH group is found in the side chain of serine and threonine, threonine. Now, let us talk about this hydrogen bond acceptor. So, we have this C double bond O group and as you can see in this peptide bond, there is a C double bond O group. So, this C double bond O group, it comes from the peptide bond. And this carboxyl group, it is found in the side chain of aspartate and glutamate, aspartate and glutamate. Remember, all the amino acids contain C double O minus group which is bound to the alpha carbon. 
but those are not free in case of peptide. Why? Because this C double O minus group, it participates in the peptide bond and it is converted to this form. So, this group and this group both are different. Now, let us discuss about this hydrophobic interaction and then ionic bond. So, now the third stabilizing force, it is the hydrophobic interaction. Now, hydrophobic interactions, this occurs between the hydrophobic side chains of amino acid. Where does it occurs? It occurs between hydrophobic side chains, hydrophobic side chains of amino acid. So, we know that we have valine, its side chain is the hydrophobic. We have leucine, its side chain is also hydrophobic. Isoleucine, its side chain is also hydrophobic. So, what happens? All of these hydrophobic side chains, they try to remain into the close proximity. Now, why they try to remain in the close proximity? Because in our body, all of this protein, it is surrounded by the polar environment, watery environment and all of these side chains, they are the water heating or you can say hydrophobic. So, by remaining in such close association, what happens? Their overall surface area is decreased and so, it is thermodynamically more stable. So, this is known as hydrophobic interaction and that is also one of the important factor for the maintenance of the tertiary structure. Now, generally this hydrophobic side chains, they are found in the core of the compact globular protein okay? and such association keeps them away from the water environment. And now, the last type of stabilizing force, it is the ionic bond, ionic bond or which is also known as electrostatic interaction, electrostatic interaction. Now, this ionic bond, it is very easy to understand. We know that the positive charge, it is attracted towards negative charge and negative charge, it is attracted towards the positive charge, opposite charge as opposite charges are attracted towards each other. So, we have some positive amino acids, some negative amino acids. So, examples of positive amino acids are lysine and arginine. This lysine and arginine and we have negative charge amino acid, the, those are aspartate, aspartate and glutamate. So, what happens? Lysine and arginine, they are attracted towards aspartate and glutamate. So, there is a formation of ionic bond. Now, we had discussed about the stabilizing forces, right? Now, let us talk about what is the significance of tertiary structure, significance of tertiary structure. Now, this tertiary structure, it is responsible or essential for the biological activity. Tertiary structure, it is the essential for biological activity, biological activity of protein. Now, let us try to understand this thing with the help of one example. So, one example is there, it is ribonuclease. In case of ribonuclease, there are two important histidine molecule, two important histidine amino acids are there. One histidine is located at the 12th position and another histidine, it is located on the 119th position of the primary amino acid sequence. Now, they are arranged like this. Suppose, this is the tertiary structure of ribonuclease. This is the 12th position histidine and this is the 119th position histidine. Okay? Both of this histidine, although they are very far from each other, in this tertiary structure, they are coming near to each other. And this portion, it makes up the active site of this ribonuclease. Active site of this ribonuclease. Active site means the active part of particular enzyme. Okay? So, that is the main functioning part. So, we can say that because of this folding, this far located histidine, they are brought near to each other and this is the mainly functioning part of particular protein. So, we can say the, that biological activity of this ribonuclease, it is because of the tertiary structure. So, now one last concept is remain that is domain. Now, what is domain? Domain, it is a functional unit of protein. It is the functional unit of protein. 
Now let's try to understand this domain again with the help of this thread. Okay. So suppose this is the tertiary structure of some protein, right? Now here we have only one polypeptide chain, but it is its three dimensional structure is such that it is making a two globular portion and both globular portions are connected by this amino acid chain okay and this is a flexible one and this protein is such that this part carries out one function and this part carries out another function so we can say that this protein has a two domain okay some protein may have three domain four domain five domain some protein has only one domain that is protein itself okay so essentially this is only a one protein but it is acting like it is two separate protein. This is protein 1 and protein 2. So, when such portion is found in any protein, we call it as a domain. So, what is domain? Domain is the functional unit of protein and it is relatively independent. It is relatively independent. Each domain has a characteristic of small globular protein as I had already explained you. Each domain has a characteristic of small globular protein. And in case of domain as low as 25 amino acid and as high as 300 amino acids can be there in each domain. So, 25 to 300 amino acids per domain. So, this is all about the tertiary structure of protein. If you have any query or confusion, please write it down in the comment section below. Thank you.